study your word about uh, being disciples, Father. Uh, we thank you that you've allowed us to make it here safely, Father. And, um, we ask that you just give uh, safe travel mercy to those that are on their way. Uh, and those that aren't able to make it, Father God, we ask that you continue to bless them and watch over them. Um, we ask that Holy Spirit just have your way in the midst of everything um, that is made uh, parent in here tonight, Father God, we ask that you just continue to convict us, to yes. um, just continue to sanctify us and make mm -hmm. us into the image of your son, Jesus Christ, who died on the cross and just was the humble servant that we um, strive each and every day to be, Father. So we thank you, we praise you, it's in Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen. So, how's everyone's week going so far? How, how is everyone's how's everyone's homework <laughs> what, what has has anybody applied anything from the homework this week anybody anything any applications <laughs> All right. well since there's no real applications I do, I do have one question for you, so mm -hmm. that's something that I, out of all, out of all of it, you know, uh, it's, on the day one, it said Luke 14, 25 to 35. Mm -hmm. Luke 14, 26 and 17, I'd like to know what that, I, I know what I read, I'd like to know what it means, how that should be interpreted. Right. Luke 14, 26. about the cost of discipleship. Mm -hmm. I got the rest of it, but yeah. that, that was... So the phrase you're talking about is, if anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sisters, yes, and even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. Yes. Okay. Now, I, you know, I got the other part. I, I understand the parables, but that one kind of... I just want to make sure I'm interpreting it right. I don't, I don't want to interpret it literally. <laughs> Well, when you look at the word hate, it's a different meaning. Um, you're not looking at actual hatred. You're looking at love less or like less. So when you look at the book of Luke, he uses the word hate a lot. So it's not really saying you need to hate your father, you need to hate your brother. It's you need to prioritize. You need to love this person less than you love me. Mm -hmm. Got it. Okay. Good. Just as long as it wasn't literal. <laughs> the rest of my God. That one. Like, oh, okay. Thank you. Okay. I mean, and also too that uh, it would on the outside too. You can think about it as well that other people watching a disciple and their love for Jesus 
may cause them to do some things where they might neglect, you know, they might follow Jesus versus doing something for their family. And the outside world might go, man, they must hate their family, right? So it's yeah. that the love is comparison, right? The love yeah, yeah, yeah. may look like hate compared to the devotion that you have for Jesus. You truly have the faith, yeah, okay. Because that's what all the, that's what all the other as you went through the rest of it, that's what they were talking about. Mm -hmm. Okay, but that's I get interpretation. Just said, yeah. yes. Yeah. It's not that you don't like them; it's that you like me more. Right. Mm -hmm. right. Okay. All right. <laughs> good. Good one. And I just want to um, share something that asked the question: Has has there been any application to what you're learning? And I just uh, was thinking about sharing the good news because we all are missionaries. We all are called to share the good news. But then I I have to think to myself. There's a way to share it, and we have to share it out of love. And sometimes, especially when you're dealing with family members, <laughs> you sometimes share in a way that could turn them off. Mm -hmm. And so I just had to repent and ask God to help me tame my tongue, help me to say it in a way that just showing love and not <laughs> browbeating, so to speak. Right. So yes, yeah, so I, I'm, tr I'm trying. And ask God to help me. <laughs> You actually touched on something that we're going to discuss a little bit in this. That was definitely a good one. Anybody else? I think the um, one of the homeworks, it wasn't this one specifically that really touched me, was after we finished baptism. And it says, ask someone what their baptism experience was. And we talked a little bit about that. And when you get to the root of it, a lot of people really don't know about that. And I share with someone, and because of that, they have now chosen to be baptized. Because it was more like, well, I did it when I was young, but they didn't really think about it. But I didn't become a, um, a Christian to after I didn't trust in Christ until I was an adult. So they figured that that was okay, but now they really know more about that. And so I really like that um homework that asks about applying it and going out and talking to people. Because there's some good things in here just to, just choosing one thing to say, well, this week, this is what I'm going to try. And it guides you. And I like what Sister Cynthia said about sharing with your family members because a lot of times you hesitate because they know your past. And then they want to say, well, how are you going to come tell me about Jesus when you used to do this, this, and this, and this? But you could say, but yeah, you know what, that's what I used to do, but I'm, I'm a new creature in Christ now. You get to share what Christ has done for you. That's part of one of the home about sharing your testimony. Yeah, you know me very well, because I did used to do that, but I don't do those things anymore. You know, when I thank God for grace, for saving me from those things that I used to do. Anybody else? So we're going to get started on this lesson. This lesson is about defining a disciple. And the key truth that we're going to be looking at is to be a disciple of Jesus is to participate in God's redemptive mission for the world. And does everybody remember what God's mission was? Yeah. Matthew 28, 19 and 20. Mm -hmm. Go there for. Say it out loud. It go, was a great commission. Great commission. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, disciples. baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe everything I have commanded you, and remember I am with you always to the end of the age. Mm -hmm. All right. So if you look at page 92, we're going to start with some basic word association. It talks about nouns and verbs, and how words have double meaning. So you look at milk. We have milk that we drink. And then you have milk like milking a cow. Right? Same word, different meaning. Right? You got the word hammer. You can hammer some nails into something, or you can pick up a hammer and use it. You have different types of words smell. So you can actually smell something, or you can smell yourself. <laughs> that too. <laughs> So when you look at the word disciple, it has double meaning. It's both a noun and a verb. So when we look at the noun disciple, we're disciples. Okay? But then when you look at the Great Commission, it tells us to go make disciples. Go disciple. Disciple others. Okay? 
So what does it mean, this is an open question for everybody, what does it mean, don't read into it, what does it mean to be a disciple? What does it mean to be a disciple? Just a disciple. A disciple is one to follow. Follow the teachings of Christ. Don't read into it. Oh, I know. Follow. Right, student. Student. All right. Now, you can say, what's it? What's it mean to be a disciple of Christ? To follow His teachings and His way of life. There we go. All right. So what we're going to be looking at is being a disciple of Christ. So we have two things. We have discipleship and discipling. Now, discipleship we're going to talk about next week, but it all comes from the root of disciple. Discipleship is a noun, but it's talking about our personal following of Christ, and that's what we're going to discuss next week. What we're talking about generally is discipling, which is helping others to follow Christ. And when we're talking about being a disciple, that's talking about both the noun and the verb. So the focus is always going to be on Jesus Christ. Whatever your center is, whatever you decide to put at that center, prayerfully it's Jesus, that's who you are a disciple of. So if I'm a disciple of this iPad right here, I'm a disciple of an iPad. Because I'm focused on nothing but this. My life revolves around this. So I'm a disciple of this iPad. If I'm a follower of Christ, I should be a disciple of Christ. That means Christ is my center. Christ is my focus. Granted, I may have all these other things around me, but still my focus should always go back to the center. Alright? So now, we're looking at the key theme to be a disciple of Christ is to participate. So we have two types of participation. We have active participation and passive participation. So let's talk about being passive first. When you look at the definition of being passive, it's accepting or allowing what happens or what others do without an active response or resistance. When you look at active, the definition of active, it's doing things rather than simply giving it one support, participating, or being engaged in a particular sphere or activity. So when we look at discipling, we have passive discipling, we have active discipling. We'll start with the easy one, active discipling. You read the Great Commission, go and make disciples of all nations. What are some examples of going and making disciples of all nations? Witnessing. Witnessing. Missions. Missions. What else? Missionary work. Missionary work. That's what you're doing, now for teaching. Teaching. Also so, serving. Serving. Hmm. Mm -hmm. Might hold on to that one. Hold on to that one, Tracy. Mm -hmm. All right. So, for the majority of those, except for serving right now, what do those have in common? They are all a form of verbal communication. Would everyone tend to agree on that? In verbal communication. Mm -hmm. All right. So now, looking at the Great Commission, passively. As you go, make disciples of all nations. As you go, make disciples of all nations. What are some examples of passive discipling? Which would be? Is that the serving? Did you say the whole one? Hold on to that one too. <laughs> Maybe um, associating with folks you work with. I mean, you're going to be there anyway. Okay. <laughs> Rather than going, you know, actively go to a mission field. Okay. <laughs> Your purpose is not to disciple, but to do it. Okay. Maybe living a godly, holy life, because you're not speaking, and so you're just watching you. Um, yeah, I guess I'll say it's passive. Lifestyle, nonverbal communication. 
What about putting tracks on people's cars or in people's doors? Not having to actually say something to somebody, but just like passing something off. No interaction. No interaction. All right. So the difference between the active and passive is the verbal and nonverbal communication word aspect that we're looking at. So now we're going to go to the aspect of serving. So Tracy, I'm going to ask you, what is an example of active serving, active discipling and serving? Well, I think if I'm serving in the church, right, and in ministry, I'm being, I'm actively doing something. And through that, other people are watching you. And they're seeing you do that, and that's a form of disciple. Because they're watching you. I'm going to say I'm a disciple, and I choose let me be my disciple and never sit down and do something. But I need to teach her and show her or anybody else that this is what you do as a disciple. You just don't sit there and tell you to go do something. But then I don't do nothing. I don't do anything myself. Can active serving be that you serve someone, mm -hmm. but you engage them with an opportunity to have an understanding of Christ? And then passive serving should, could be, well, I do this good deed, but at no point do I disciple, or do I no longer, or at no point do I share the gospel with you, but I'm still doing a good deed and serving. But I, that's why I always uh, say to people, like, when they connect with, say, like, uh, groups that want to help people, but they don't bring Christ into it. You're only meeting their physical need, but you're not meeting a spiritual need. Mm -hmm. And active, you should be helping to meet the spiritual need, which is most important. But I can, can you really disciple if you're not being active? Mm -hmm. Because I'm thinking if you're discipling action verbs, you're doing yeah. stuff. But if you're just passive, <laughs> are you really <laughs> discipling yeah. or doing anything? It sounds like an oxymoron mm -hmm. of two that's thrown yeah. there. I was having yeah. the same thought. That if you're not, if you're discipling, you have to be engaged. Okay. So we'll use this as an example. So I'm speaking up here. We'll get right to you, Mary. I'm speaking up here. Would that be a form of active discipling? Yeah, that's like Deacon John say you're teaching. Yeah. You're teaching. Okay. So if I just stood here and I just went, you being here by yourself. <laughs> <laughs> so are you saying that your t-shirt is a passive form of uh, discipling you know I am a follower it speaks to where you are so when I look at you and I see what you're doing and I read your shirt are you telling me that I you know what I'm saying especially if you don't do what the rest of the world does the, the shirt will cause engagement, right. and the point of exactly. engagement then it goes from being passive to active. Right. Right. Well, maybe the shirt won't cause engagement. Yep. It, 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 it may not. Yeah. So, so right. you know, when I think of the discipleship, I, was, I think of you know, mm -hmm. you have to make the I also think of the modeling mm -hmm. part of it. I mean, you're doing yeah. something when you're discipling. I could just you know. Say, well, I live a Christian life, and people always see my Christian life, and that ought to help them. Well, it might, but it might not. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> because, but you know, I mean, I'm not helping to model for them. I mean, I can live a Christian life, and your daily endeavors are different from me. And you can look at me and say, well, your life is easy. You know, you could be a Christian because you never get sick. You know, whereas I, I stay sick all the time. So, yeah, I think... <laughs> I think there's a deeper definition to disciples than just showing off your religious <laughs> paraphernalia. <Yeah. laughs> you know, Brother Marion, Sister Cynthia, and then Ulysses. I was just going to say another example of active discipleship would be submiss being submissive. Um, when we go to the nursing homes, volunteers are asked to go or discipling out in the community. Again, you're, you're requesting volunteers. So being submissive to that request. And I'm thinking about the pacifist. Uh, that's where I sit back. I'm a believer in Christ, but I sit back and you go. And I'll help you go. If you're going on a mission trip, I'll help you go. If you're going around the corner, I'll monetary or, or someone's sick or someone, I'll give 
but don't ask me to do anything. <laughs> I, I think we have to begin by giving like the, the most foundational aspect of discipling that makes it different from any other forms of teaching. So the one part of discipling that must be unique is that a disciple must point to Jesus Christ. So so I, I understand passive versus active in the sense that God, by his providence, if you are doing the passive discipling, even if it's not verbal, someone will be then brought into engagement for active discipling. Mm -hmm. However, if someone is just doing like uh, social work or service to help someone, now how do you differentiate that from an ordinary unbeliever doing the same thing? You cannot, you cannot call a passive disciple. That's not, not, that's not that just being philanthropic if you're not pointing to Christ. Right. There has to be an opportunity where someone can then come and say, why are you doing this? And then you can go into active disciple. If it's not there, then you're not doing any disciple at all. I mean, you have to be doing something that somebody who is not a believer cannot do, right? Because you are a disciple, you are pointing to Christ. It must be something that they, if they are doing just externally, it will not do anything to, to transform someone's heart or to turn them towards engaging into active disciple. But what I was talking about being passive is that, you know, as a uh, as a disciple, you 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 write you're not you're not using your verbal, you know, uh, your speech or your sharing the gospel, but you're helping others get out there and share. And in the hopes that someone will come to know Christ, but you're not actually taking a part in it. So you just passive. Well, it's like you can be and speak from my own experience in marriage. You can be sitting there and they're talking. You kind of listen to them. Okay? So active in a relationship would be us communicating back and forth. Passive is she's communicating. I'm not my head. <laughs> <laughs> I'm really out the corner of my eye looking at the TV or thinking about something at work. Right? Right, so that's that's why it, in order for something to be active, you have to engage right. the person. Mm -hmm. right. And so that's and, it, and it's like and Christ showed us that because when he would give parables or if he did something, then he would kind of like ask him, well, what did you think? You know, kind of that's literally what he was doing to him. That was engaging. And then he'd tell them something, and they'd be over there, boy, help me understand that. And then once they got it, you're like, ah. Oh. And that's where active, because it's like going into a class and the professor just give you the notes and say, I'll see you next week. <laughs> help me understand what I'm getting ready to go study so I see what it builds on. So I, I think in order for it to truly be an active, you have to have. You have to talk about Christ, no matter even yeah. if you are serving. The purpose has to be that Christ is still involved. Because if you do it passively, you can do good deeds. It doesn't bring Christ. Christ. It doesn't bring Christ to the forefront. I was just thinking for myself is that unless I'm doing it intentionally and being equipped, then I can't decide. Mm -hmm. That's right. For me, the, the, the question is difficult because active seems to have this new activity. And passive seems to be the opposite, but I don't know if that's the, that's the point of the matter. They could, you could be doing a lot of activity and not really be a disciple. Mm -hmm. I guess that's, that's kind of the, the thing that, that gets me. Is that you can also be passive but not really not be discipling. Like I always think of my, for me it's my mother and my father, the influences in terms of what they say and do in faith. Mother, very, very seemingly quiet, but you can understand that she's grounded in God and grounded in Jesus and everything she does. So that influence is just wells, it, it, it influences people, it influences me. My father very, very outspoken, very, very loud. But not everything that he says is an active uh, thing about disciple. Even though he's speaking of God, it doesn't have that effect. Mm -hmm. So to me, it's a, 
it's difficult to parse them apart. You see that somewhere they, they kind of cross, and I think there at the go. end of the day, there what you need to say is you speak the truth, and everything points to Jesus, and mm -hmm. it's everything mm -hmm. about the Spirit, no matter whatever it is, and you have the fruit of it. There you go. Mm -hmm. When you, our whole purpose is to go out into the crowd, and the crowd is where the non believers are. And with that, we have to evangelize. Mm -hmm. So that requires verbal communication. The gospel requires verbal communication. So you have to be active on that. When you get to the point where now you're dealing with believers, you can still be passive, but you're still active at the same time. Mm -hmm. So it still goes hand in hand. It's like it's not wrong being passive, but it's not wrong being all active. They go hand in hand. Because there are times when, for example, when you look at it as somebody in the community or somebody in the crowd, homeless person will say, I'll use this as an example, they need something. They need a home, they need food, they need shelter. We could throw money at the situation. That's being passive. When you actually, okay, let me take you. Let me bring you someplace. Let me bring you something. Let me give you this. Let me give you that creating an opportunity of self-sacrifice for yourself and an opportunity to present the gospel to that person, that is being active. Does that kind of make sense? Mm -hmm. Instead of just more so out of obligation, as Sister Cynthia was talking about earlier, it's like self-sacrifice, extending grace instead of being out of obligation. So now we're going to dig down into the meat of what we're going to discuss tonight, which is in John chapter 1, verses 29 through 42. I'll give you a brief history of what's going on. Um, when you look at chapter 1, in the book of John, uh, verses 1 through 18, we're talking about the nature and identity of Jesus Christ. Uh, when you look at John 1, 1 and 2, when the beginning was the Word, and the Word was God, and the Word was God, He was in the beginning with God. We're looking at Jesus Christ being the Word. Uh, you're also seeing John the Baptist come in. Um, there was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to bear witness about the light that all might believe through him. He was not the light, but he came to bear witness about the light. And at this time, we're talking about he was empowered by the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit was resting upon him. And we read that kind of um, in Acts chapter 1, verse 8. You will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. Now, it's a big difference. The Old Testament, the Holy Spirit rested upon prophets and people back then. Uh, you can look at the example of David in uh, 1 Samuel chapter 16, verse 13, where it talks about the Spirit of the Lord rushed upon David from that day forward, and Samuel uh, rose up and went to Ramah. And then uh, in Psalms chapter 51, verse uh, 11, it talks about how David was repenting um, for his sin with Bathsheba, where he said, cast me not away from your presence and take not your Holy Spirit away from me. So the Old Testament, the Holy Spirit rested upon the individual, but then left. When we look at the New Testament, when the Holy Spirit resides in believers, resides within believers, um, and to confirm that, John 14, verse 16 and 17, and I will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper to be with you forever even the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him. You know him for he dwells with you and will be in you. So the Holy Spirit resides within believers today. When you get to chapter 1 verses 19 through 28, we're looking at the first day. And this is where John the Baptist is speaking to the crowd. We have non-believers in there, specifically representatives from the Pharisees, uh, Jews, and we see John's mission. John's already grafted in this mission um, that God has already ordained. He said, I'm the one crying out in the wilderness, make straight the way of the Lord, as the prophet Isaiah said. And he was proclaiming a message of repentance and of judgment. And then when you look at verses 26 and 27, John answered them, I baptize with water, but among you stands one you do not know, even he who comes after me, the straps of whose sandals I am not worthy to untie. 
Back then, baptism was an outward sign of inward repentance, which is the same thing for today. An outward sign of what has taken place on the inside. And John the Baptist's whole focus was pointing to someone greater than himself, which was Christ. So that brings us to the beginning of our lesson. We're going to start on day two. So if I could have somebody read John chapter 1, verses 29 through 34. The next day, John saw Jesus coming toward him and said, Here is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. This is the one I told you about. After me comes a man who ranks ahead of me because he existed before me. I didn't know him, but I came baptizing with water so he might be revealed to Israel. And John testified, I saw the Spirit descending from heaven like a dove, and he rested on him. I didn't know him, but he who sent me to baptize with water told me, the one you see, the Spirit descending and resting on, he is the one who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. I have seen and testified that this is the Son of God. All right, thank you for reading that. So now we are on day two. And this is where John the Baptist is now speaking to the crowd or the community? Believers and non believers? Who's he speaking to here? Any guess? He's speaking to everyone who's around. Some of his disciples and, like you said, the Pharisees and uh, I guess the Sadducees as well. They're all around. So So here we're going to see Christ's mission begin to be revealed, which is in verse 29 where, can somebody read just verse 29? The next day John saw Jesus coming toward him and said, here is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. What's Christ's mission? Just in that verse alone, what is Christ's mission? <laughs> All right. So, now we're seeing Christ's mission being revealed as part of this. All right? So, John the Baptist, in this whole scripture, he identifies as four things. First, he identifies him as the Lamb of God. Second, he identifies him as the one who existed before me. Now, John the Baptist was older than Jesus by a few months. So how is this one, the one who existed before John, when John was born before him? Because the word was in the beginning. There you go. So it's already showing that this person, this one, is greater than John the Baptist himself. So now he also calls him the one who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. And then he lastly references him as the Son of God. Now, if John the Baptist had to be given a sign to know that he was the Christ, and it's where it says, I did not know him, but he who sent me to baptize with water told me, the one you see the Spirit sending on and resting on, he is the one who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. Now, we see the Holy Spirit descend like a dove. Why would it be like a dove? Why not like a chicken? Why not like a duck? <laughs> Why not like a fly? Why not anything else? Dove is a symbol of peace. Like that one. I like that one. What else? Testing your Old Testament. I was going to say, uh, no, he's the dove. No, he's the dove. <laughs> no, he sent out a, a, a bird because it would come back. Mm -hmm. Something about the dove would come back, but the other bird didn't even come back. So the dove were also among the list of animals that would be a second. There you go. There you go. When you read Leviticus chapter 5, verse 7, but if he cannot afford a land, that he shall bring to the Lord as his compensation for the sin that he has committed two turtle doves, two doves, or two pigeons, one for a sin offering and the other for a burnt offering. 
the dove was one of the clean animals that you could sacrifice if you were too poor to afford a lamb. So it stood for purity and lowliness or humility. So of all the birds that connect heaven and earth by their flying and landing, the dove was the one that seemed the most suitable symbol of the Holy Spirit. Because the Holy Spirit is holy, pure, and mostly lowly or humble person of the Trinity. And that's not for me, though, John Piper. So when you look at page 94, we're still on day one. The very last paragraph. The world has been broken and corrupted by sin. We as individuals are broken and corrupted by sin. But Jesus came to fix the problem of sin. His death and resurrection opened the door for redemption. They allow us to experience forgiveness of our sins and live in a restored or redeemed relationship with God. This is the gospel. This is the good news. So, we are all disciples here. We are all adults here. This is where transparency comes in. I'm not going to force anybody to share. But there's a question at the bottom that I kind of modified a little bit. So the question says, where have you seen the mission of Christ or something similar to that? I changed the question to more so, and this is why I say this is a self-reflection one, and self-analysis to see where you, being honest with yourself and where you truly are. Where have you seen Christ's mission of removing a specific sin from your life? Where have you seen Christ's mission of removing a specific sin from your life? If anybody wants to share, go right on ahead. I've seen a lot of sins that need to move from my life. But I guess the biggest one is uh, fornication. You know, um, just just how God created marriage before, and when you go out and do that, and then you get caught up in it and all this other stuff, and it draws a wedge in between your relationship between God and just having to go to him and repent and ask him to forgive me for that and to remove the temptation of wanting to do that. And he's, he's, he's able to do that. And, and once you do that, you are, you're, you're cleansed from that, even though you have your old ways. And that's why I say sometimes it's hard to share with people that's from your family because they know what you did in your past. But then you try to teach them, well, you know, I went down that road, and that's not the road you want to go on because God has something better for you. And then when you do get married, you're bringing this sin of your past into your marriage and so he had to remove um that from me and it was it was it was amazing but all, and it was um it's it's hard when you have sin it could be sin from drinking smoking it's like it takes over it becomes an idol or whatever but once you trust god to remove that sin from your life um things change things change unforgiveness was a a hard one for me, um, and some of you that know me have heard me say before that um, I wanted God to remove it because of a certain thing that happened in my life. And when He began rooting it out or uprooting it from the root, the pain of that was worse than the pain that I experienced going through that uh, portion of my life. To the point that at one time I told him, you know, it hurts too much, just never mind. Mm -hmm. Let it stay, yep. right? Um, but thank God that he is God mm -hmm. um, because he wouldn't allow it. Mm -hmm. um, and I, even talking about it, I remember how it felt when he started answering my prayer to help me to forgive. But it had to come up from the root. It couldn't just be pick a leaf off, right? And you know, leave the um, leave the actual roots in the ground. And so that was a process. And over time, um, I learned how to um, allow him to heal me 
I learned how to forgive, and I learned how to um, handle future and further hurt um, in a different way. So that, 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 was, that was a huge thing. Um, real time. Uh, yesterday? <laughs> yesterday. <laughs> yeah, so God is still working on me. So, uh, and it was evidence yesterday. Uh, dropped the wife off at the grocery store. And I spent too much time there apparently for someone who was behind me. So before I could move the car, I got a lecture. Is that person you can't stand there for a minute? You had to go somewhere. My past, the me in the past, uh, it bubbled up and surfaced, and I go, okay, no, I can't do that anymore. I know what I want, what the flesh wanted to do. I wanted to react. I wanted to respond. Uh, he's still working on me. He can't do that anymore. Who was it? Thought so. That's that's the new me. <laughs> we are all works. In progress. We are all works in progress. Yeah, you still hear that voice, though. Wait a minute, he just said something. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 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 Everything I do, I'll be confirmed about doing this. Like, I know I need to do this. I know I can do this. I know I'm supposed to do this. But I will doubt myself time after time after time about doing something. So it's like, God will tell me, okay, Jay, you're supposed to do this. I'll be like, okay, I'm ready to do this. And then it's like, kind of this, uh, did you really say? Am I supposed to? You know I'm not prepared. I got other things to do right now. I got this going on. I got that going on. And I start to doubt myself. It's like, okay, well, maybe I should do it, but I'm not sure that I'm fully equipped. So I know my flesh definitely tells me that I still work in progress with that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> um, when I grew up, I was in a position in the family where I felt somewhat insignificant. Okay, um, just not as significant as my younger siblings, and, because I was raised by my grandparents. And so I think throughout life, I was doing stuff, you know, for attention, because I felt insignificant. And that explains the mischievous little boy that I told you about. <laughs> 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 but, you know, and, I, um, and as I grew up and got in a position where I could do things in the community or in the church, I kept telling maybe myself that I don't need accolades. I'm not doing this for accolades. And I'm sure I told some other people that too. And then something happened that hurt me because I didn't get accurate. Mm -hmm. And that's when I realized I was lying to myself. <laughs> <laughs> and I finally had to deal with that and said, okay, I really don't need accurate. And so, you know, I had to get to that place where I don't do things for accurate anymore. You know, but I was saying it, but it wasn't true. <laughs> and so God just reminded me, I thought you said it. <laughs> yeah. 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 Another one I struggle with is being cognizant of others' feelings. That is the hardest one because when I was growing up and having a military background, it's like you leave, you check your emotions at the door. Everything is at the door. Everything is black and white. So then when I got married, you want to talk about emotions coming out? It's just like, okay, now I don't know how to deal with this. Okay, now I'm going to shut you out from your emotions. I'm going to listen to what you say, but I'm going to shut everything else off. So being cognizant of my wife's emotions and other people's emotions, it's just like, okay, I understand things one way. You're speaking another way through emotion. It's like, I don't understand that, so I'm just kind of like writing you off from it. So with me, definitely I struggle with that a lot. I say that uh, 
I kind of feel like what Larry was talking about because I was stuck in the middle. So you got three on the front of you, three on the back, and it kind of like I had to fend for myself. And they always like, oh, he's so self-sufficient. They was like, no, I'm doing because I want to find my way to fit in in the niche and get some of this attention. And I think that what I kind of did was before I would do something, I would think of myself first. And I realized, okay, I got to see what David gets out of this, and then we go from there. And when God began to humble me, it was like, like I told you guys, I think a few weeks ago, I don't know if you got, I'm 25 years old, and I'm sitting in the principal's office, and he and I are going back and forth, and he was like, well, what are you going to do? I said, man, I'm out. I said, I'll have a job before we blink. You know, I, that was my cockiness at that time. And as we fast forward 20-some odd years later, it hadn't happened in that manner. And, but what God revealed to me is that if you put others first, you'll be amazed at what I do for you and through you. And it was like, to, to think about because you what are you, what are you talking about? You got to be self-sufficient. You got to take care of number one. But when you start thinking of others' feelings or their needs before your own, then God just lines things up so much better. And um, so it's like I thank Him that He's revealed that to me because it used to be I may ask somebody how, how they're doing, but I might not really been listening. Now it's like He has me where I get like really truly, and I'm like there. And it's like, what can you do? And there's been people where it's like I can walk in and it's like the spirit puts it on me or there's something wrong. Just, just go up to them, just talk to them, fill them out. They might just need a hug. And then people just start revealing things to you. And, but before, I'm going to ask them, how you doing? But I'm trying to get past them to the next person who I think can help me get something accomplished. But that's that's where you have to like understand that he humbled me. I mean, and when I say he humbled me, there's many times I can just think about how I just cried when I just knew. I'd walk out of there, oh, I know I got this. And you don't got it. <laughs> yeah. And it was like, well, what did I do wrong? You didn't do anything <clears throat> wrong. You're just not the one. How am I not the one if I didn't do anything wrong? Because <laughs> it's all about, I made it about myself. And then when you do know there's a possibility it won't work out, but Lord, I trust you, it's like there, that's where you begin to grow because it's like now I'm not depending on myself. Um, and that's where, the, so the humbling that he did is just like, I mean, it's amazing because there was that self-confidence and arrogance and he humbled me. So I, I thank him for that. That's good. And also I think I, um, I struggle with low self-esteem and always looking out at other people uh, at times wishing I was like that person and like that person. And God is, God, he's dealing with me and I'm to a place now in my life where I feel like I'm not there yet. But I feel like, Lord, I'm unique. Mm -hmm. You made me this way. Mm -hmm. You made me. I don't have what maybe somebody else has. You know, I don't have. I, I shouldn't look at that. I should look at how God has made me. Mm -hmm. right. And so I'm, I'm beginning to love myself more than what I did growing up. I always felt that I was different than others. And, you know, when you start comparing yourself right. to the shapely women and to the, you know, the pretty women or to the, you know, when you start comparing yourself, it's easy to get caught up in, you know, all the other girls have boyfriends and you sitting back, you know. And so by that, you find yourself getting caught up in situations, in in other things that you shouldn't be to justify to be accepted. See, now that's good, because we're all disciples. And like I said, whatever your center is, prayerfully it's Jesus. Whatever situation you're going through, it goes right to Jesus. We're empowered by the Holy Spirit. Whatever situation, if we put that situation there, that's what we're going to focus on. Whatever that situation is. Jesus is bigger than that whole situation. Jesus is bigger than the whole situation. He's out here with the crowd. He's with the community. He's definitely with the core. So if we say that we're followers and disciples of Christ, whatever that situation is, there's going to be some sanctification during that process, but we're students, we're followers, we're supposed to be looking more and more like him. So those things that we're going through aren't going to overtake us, 
but it's going to be purged from us little by little so we can look more and more like Jesus. So now, if I can have somebody read verses 35 through 42, and now we're going to be on day three. (coughs) The next day John was standing with two of his disciples. When he saw Jesus passing by, he said, Look, the Lamb of God. The two disciples heard him say this and followed Jesus. When Jesus turned and noticed them following him, he asked them, What are you looking for? They said to him, Rabbi, which means teacher, where are you staying? Come and you'll see, he replied. So they went and saw where he was staying, and they stayed with him that day. It was about four in the afternoon. Andrew, Simon's Peter, Simon Peter's brother, was one of the two who heard John and followed him. He first found his own brother, Simon, and told him, We have found the Messiah, which is translated the Christ. And he brought Simon to Jesus. All right, so thank you for reading that. Now we're looking at a different mission. We are looking at John the Baptist is telling his disciples, that core group of Andrew and John, go, follow Christ. So we're going to listen to something very quickly, and it'll tie us into the rest of the lesson. stressing that the Holy Spirit came upon and he remained upon Jesus. Why? Why that stress? It's all serving the main point that Jesus is now the one who can baptize with the Spirit. The Holy Spirit comes, rests, remains on Jesus. Not John. Jesus. So Jesus is the one bearing, carrying, covered, And when the Holy Spirit baptizes anyone, it's coming from Jesus. That's the point. Baptizing with the Spirit and baptizing with water are radically different things. And this is the stress. The testimony is, He's the baptizer in the Spirit. I'm just the baptizer with water. Everything is getting set to make that the main point. Baptizing with the Spirit and baptizing with water is the difference between lightning and the lightning bug. It's the difference between a person and painting. It's the difference between marriage and a ring. It's the difference between birth and a birth certificate. It's the difference between immersion in fluid and immersion in God. He's he's laboring to say, I'm just a water guy. He's a God guy. He's a spirit guy. Everything he does is done as the God man. And what he does is take away sin as the lamb and baptize in the Holy Spirit. Go to him. Don't stay with me. All I've got is water. Last part he says is all I, all I have is water. What he has is the Holy Spirit. So now we see John the Baptist start to disappear off the scene. His whole mission was to point to Christ. He was preparing the way for the Lord. And he had disciples. But he told his disciples to go. And this is where... You don't see Christ specifically say, come follow me. They see, as you look in the first couple of verses, it says, behold the Lamb of God. So, John the Baptist is speaking. Behold, there's the Lamb of God. Two disciples, Andrew and John, heard him say this, and they immediately followed Jesus. They left John, followed Jesus. When they followed Jesus... 
Andrew went to go get his brother. He went on the first short-term mission trip. And the first person he went to was his family, his brother, his brother Peter. John MacArthur from 12 Ordinary Men says, this portion illustrates how every disciple is called first to salvation. We must recognize Jesus as the true Lamb of God and Lord of all and embrace him by faith. This stage of the disciples is the call to conversion, Christ's call to conversion. That stage of the disciples' call did not involve full-time discipleship. The gospel narrative suggests that although they followed Jesus in the sense they gladly heard his teaching and submitted to him as their teacher, they remained at their full-time jobs, earned a living through regular employment. That's why, from this point until Jesus called them to full-time ministry, which we read in Luke 5, we often see them fishing and mending their nets. So they were still doing their regular jobs at the time, but they followed Christ and listened to his teaching until Christ called them to decide, uh, to be his apostles. When we look at the last paragraph on page 95, we're getting ready to close out here. Jesus' disciples rarely engage his mission as individuals. Instead, followers of Christ typically work together in relationship with one another as they seek to advance his redemptive mission in the world. That was certainly Jesus' preference during his public ministry. <clears throat> he didn't recruit converts and then send them out to do his work in isolation. Instead, he gathered disciples to <coughs> himself so they could follow him as a community, even as a family. When we see all the disciples come, they're with Christ. They follow Christ everywhere. They're learning. They're training with him. And then he sends them out, not individually, but sends them out when they go on their ministry, two by two, going out. They're never isolated. They're never by themselves. We see Andrew. He went on his first short-term mission trip to his brother, his immediate family. Question for thinking and self-analysis. How do we engage non-believing family members? Are we active with them? Do we actively evangelize them? Or do we passively evangelize them by our lifestyles? What about people at our jobs or non-believing non-family? Do we effectively, actively engage them and evangelize them? Or do we passively evangelize them? What about believers in the family? Do we actively disciple them or do we passively disciple them? What about within the own church? Do we actively disciple one another or do we passively disciple one another? What are some other ways in addition to evangelism that we can participate and making disciples. What are some other ways? Now, this is going to require some critical thinking skills. <coughs> you said besides evangelism? What are other ways to participate in making disciples in addition to evangelism? Discipling believers. Because, I mean, we're, we're thinking about the mission for this year, and it's people who come to church every Sunday that need to be discipled. And so uh, discipleship is an ongoing process. It's not that, okay, I gave my life to Christ, I'm saved, and now I'm done. It's, I mean, I need discipling, and then everybody needs discipling. So just because I'm a believer, I don't need to be evangelized, but I still need to be discipled. And I think that's just walking alongside, alongside someone who is a believer and, and, and discipling them as well. Mm -hmm. All right. Anything else? And I think that's encouraging others to come out to Bible study, come mm -hmm. out to Sunday school, yeah. come out to uh, um, the workshops that are provided by pastor and, and the elders. Because uh, as you stated here, that they follow Christ. And to follow yeah. someone, you're following them to learn of that person. Mm -hmm. Because how can you evangelize, how can you share the word mm -hmm. if you do not know him? Mm -hmm. So if you are a believer, you need to come out. You need to follow him. Follow the word. Come to Sunday school. Come to Bible study so we can encourage people. And that comes with, with being equipped. 
So how am I going to disciple if all I'm doing is coming to church on Sunday? I need to be in Bible study. I need to be trained on how to disciple or be in the Word so that when I am talking to other people, they ask me questions, I'm able to speak to it. So I need to continue to be taught myself so I can be able to be a good disciple and to help others. That's good. And you see, it's a, it's a cycle. Mm-hmm. We evangelize, then there's conversion that takes place, and then we disciple to show others how to go out and evangelize conversion to discipleship. It's a continuing circle. What are advantages of working as a team in this? What are examples? What are some advantages of working as a team? Some advantages. Cover each other's weakness. If I don't know, person one doesn't know, person two can jump in and say, I got that. Person three might know. And we can grow in the likeness of Christ because it takes Everyone has a different attitude, a different mindset, and working with people, you need to grow, you grow closer to Christ to be able to deal with each other. Mm-hmm. I think also you think about the disciples, it was more like protection, because you you didn't know, Jesus knew what they were up against, and so he's not going to just send them one, because they had to go to the Pharisees and the Sadducees, all of them, you know, those religious leaders, and when you go there, they try to draw you in. And so when you go and when you're able to bounce, well, this person said this to me today, how should I react? If you have that person that you are teamed up with, that you can bounce off, I didn't know how to respond. What do you think? You have someone who can hold your account, but also you can get ideas from how to help others disciple. I also think of uh, encouragement because uh, it's hard to, mm-hmm. to live a Christian life, go through life, and so when you have someone with you, you know, you see examples. When well, Paul, Paul got stoned, you know, um, in Acts outside the city, you know, disciples came around him, you know, and helped him you know, get back up and he went back into the city to, to continue, you know. Yeah. <laughs> 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 I mean, he stumbled left for dead outside the city. He, he goes back because God says, I got more, I got more believers there. I need you to go. And, but he was uplifted by the disciples. So just having a team approach. Because when you're out there by yourself, Get hit. You I'm know, done. It's easy. Yeah, it's easy to say I'm done. You got someone with you. Easy to say, you know, be encouraged, my sister, my brother. You know, we can do this. God's got us. You know, so encouragement is part of the team. And it also keeps um, it keeps people from becoming codependent on a person right. um, because no one person has all the answers. Um, and so. Um, God gives us all um, a different level of understanding, the same gospel, and um, sometimes coming from this person who may be really direct, I might not get it, but this person here who gives, you know, uh, parables, or, you know, puts it in a different, I might get it, so um, because we, we're not God, and we don't, we're not all knowing, um, it helps um, folks to you know, not look at that person as, I've got a problem now, I need to go to this person for the answer mm-hmm. instead of to, uh, I think we draw from each other's energy also. I mean, at times when, mm-hmm. I mean, my life is lots of energy, first thing in the morning, I'm dragging. <laughs> 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 and, you know, she, she's very aware of that, and so she kind of, you know, bring me along with me. <laughs> 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 so I can get hurt. But, you know, I, I think, you know, that's the case. If she wasn't there, I'd probably go to work and still drag. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, I think you do work with each other. That's the thing, comfort also, and you should draw that. The Bible says we should comfort each other and so far, and the burdens. Be the only believer will come from the fellow believer. But also, ultimately, uh, let's not forget that just because you're a disciple maker doesn't mean you don't need discipleship yourself. So, um, we are supposed to be discipling each other in church, in communion, right? So, even as we're going out to evangelize, we cannot isolate ourselves to the extent that we are not able to receive some pers- some accountability and disciples discipling from other believers. And I mean that that is necessary. It's it's kind of like not being a f- in fellowship with church. You can't just be a disciple and just go somewhere and you're the only Christian. Everybody else is a believer. <laughs> you're the only church. <laughs> <laughs> 
See, and that's you're actually touching on something that we're going to talk about next week with discipleship. That's where we're talking about our own personal problem, our own personal walk with Christ. Mm-hmm. So, pray everybody got something out of this tonight. This is definitely one of those self-reflection ones, self-analysis ones, and we have to be being disciples. We have to be honest with ourselves, and honest with each other, and that's where that sanctification process comes in. <laughs> Because you start to really see where your walk as a disciple truly is. We will stand and we will pray out. quick uh, announcement. Those who hadn't heard, uh, Sister Juanita Hunter went home to be with the Lord on yesterday. And so tentatively, looking at the uh, home going service to be on Monday at 11 o'clock. So we'll get confirmation tomorrow. I'm going to send an email out to everybody to confirm if that's the case. But just keep keep your family up in prayer. <laughs> that's all. Go I have my phone. <clears throat> Father, we come to you this evening thanking you first thank of you, God. God. for just being our God and just yes. allowing us to be witness to your power. Yes. Yes. Father, we give you all the glory and the honor yes. Yes. to call ourselves your children. Yes. Yes. So Lord, we just want to, to be servants yes. in this day yes. that we may be servants in the days to come. Yes. Yes. So Father, as you sent your son Jesus, Father, as we uh, building on our knowledge and understanding of what he came to do, yes. that we honor that yes, Lord. by being true to ourselves mm-hmm. yes. and understanding that to truly be a disciple is to sacrifice oneself mm-hmm. for the greater cause. Yes. Yes. Because he so did for us yes. Thank you, Lord. Thank God. Thank you. to the extent that he will come back to redeem all his people. Yes, Lord. Yes. So, Father, we thank you. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. And we are blessed because of that. Yes. And as we hold each other in this circle, Father, yes, Lord. we just pray for continual support for yes. the family of yes. Mount Zion, yes. even those hands that are not touching, but yes. in their hearts and in their troubles. Yes, God. Yes, God. For the bereaved family, yes. 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 we just pray for those who have lost Loved ones, yes. Yes, sir. the Hunter family, yes, uh, Brother Pritchett, yes, sir. and the yes, loss sir. of his brother, yes, sir. and Father, for just so many other things that happen in our lives that we know will continue to go on, yes, but we will continue to be ready, yes, but we know that the end is not the end of our time with you. Yes. That we have a promise. Yes. Yes. And we have an inheritance. Yes. Yes. So, Father, we just wait for that day that yes. we can yes. sit before your throne yes. Yes. and recognize that you can say to us, Job, well done. Yes. 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 Thank you. Oh, Heavenly Father, Thank we you. pray for the leadership of our church, for our pastor and his family, yes. for the elders, yes. Yes. and all those who serve here. Yes. Yes. For we are all equal in this mission. Yes. 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 Right. And we That's all right. seek to serve but yes. one God. Yes. 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 That's right. But we you, know that the greatest of what you've given us and equipped us with is to love. Yes, yes. So, Father, let us leave here in love yes. and with a better understanding yes. Yes. that Christ, our Lord, yes. is in us. Yes. In Jesus' name we pray. In Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Amen.